Hey, have you heard about Advent of Code? It's this really cool annual event for programmers. It's sort of like an advent calendar. Uh, so we're gonna be unwrapping a new treat for every day of December up to the 25th. Uh, but what's really interesting about this is that instead of it being like a chocolate or a toy, it's something much more delightfully delicious. So every day we're gonna be able to unwrap a new algorithmic coding challenge. Uh, in fact, it seems like there are going to be two for each day, so that's extra exciting. Now, this is the first year that I'm participating in this event, and I have to say, I tried the first one yesterday, and uh, it was just so much fun and so algorithmically rich that I felt like I just had to do a series of videos on it. Uh, so before we dive into that specific challenge, let's just sort of talk about our goals for this series. So the first thing is basically, this is meant to be an educational series. Uh, we're not gonna like speed run through these challenges or try to get the fastest times. We're gonna try to appreciate the programmatic concepts that each of the challenges illustrates. Uh, so we're gonna be talking about algorithms, data structures, common practices, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then as an additional constraint, um, of course I'm gonna be using JavaScript to solve these, but uh, more so, we're gonna be using the functional programming paradigm. So we've done lots of JavaScript before. Uh, functional programming is a little more outside of our comfort zone. Uh, so in terms of the, the JavaScript part of it, I mean, we're gonna be using ES6, no uh, var keywords, we'll probably use arrow functions. Uh, but in terms of what I mean by functional JavaScript, basically the main things are we're gonna be avoiding things like loops, we're not gonna be reassigning values, so basically everything is gonna be a constant, uh, and we want our functions to not have any side effects. Now, like I'm saying, uh, I'm definitely not an expert in functional JavaScript, so this is actually bringing us to our, our third and in some ways most important point. Uh, I've done a lot of this stuff, but I don't consider myself an expert or a master, so I would definitely love to hear from you. I know that uh, the people who watch this channel are some of the smartest and coolest viewers on all of YouTube, so I'd love to hear from you if you have a, a question, comment, or concern on any, of this, on any of this stuff. Okay, so let's direct our attention to the day one challenge over here. So if you've done any algorithmic coding challenges before, no surprise, they've wrapped it in a very fun and whimsical story. I'll let you read through that at your own leisure. But the main thing is that we've got a list of numbers here and we wanna find the pair of numbers uh, that adds to 2020. Uh, and then basically just to sort of prove that we've found those, we're going to submit the product of those two numbers as our answer. So unlike a platform like uh, the wonderful codesignal.com, we don't have an in-browser IDE over here. Um, they don't really mind what we use to solve this problem. They're just asking us for, uh, for this, basically this result that we wouldn't be able to get unless we solved the problem. And I mean, there, there are many ways we could solve it. We could try to do it by hand even if we wanted to, uh, but uh, functional JavaScript is I think the choice we've made for this one. Okay, so I actually think this is a beautiful starting problem because it's a perfect opportunity to illustrate the strategy that we're gonna use for each of these problems. So overall, there are basically three steps we wanna follow. The first one is that we actually wanna solve the problem, right? We wanna provide some kind of solution that works, right? Something that, that's gonna produce a result, maybe not uh, in the most elegant way, but we just wanna make sure that we understand the problem and understand how to solve it. After we've completed that, we're gonna to try to make our solution more efficient. We're gonna to try to optimize it. This is where algorithms and data structures come in. And we're gonna be talking a lot about big O notation. So I'm just gonna assume everyone is familiar with this. If you're not, definitely you know, feel free to leave a comment. We can talk about that in a future video. But for now, I'm just gonna assume that we're familiar with big O notation. Uh, the final thing is that we wanna beautify our code. We wanna make it look nice. We wanna have comments. We wanna look, make it look clear to the reader. We, want, we don't want it to look cluttered. Uh, and it's within this step that I wanna make sure that the code is adhering to the functional programming paradigm. You might say functional programming could have performance implications and therefore maybe it'd be more appropriate for that to be part of part two here. But I'm gonna consider it more of a stylistic choice at least for now. So it's in the third part that we're going to make sure this stuff is functional. Okay, let's go ahead and dive in to our day one challenge. So the first thing is that we want to get the actual puzzle input. In other words, the data that we're going to use to solve this. 
So I'm gonna click right here and all of a sudden you'll notice we, we're taken to a text file. There are a bunch of numbers on the screen. Now there are various ways we could extract this data, uh, but for now I'm gonna do it kind of the boring way. So I'm gonna copy paste this and I'm just gonna switch over to my full IDE view. I'm using VS Code over here. I'm gonna paste this in, select all, and then I'm gonna hit Alt Shift I to select all of these lines individually. And then I'm just gonna put a comma, a space, and a delete so that they're all, at least for now on one line, we'll uh, put them into an array. And now we don't need to worry about converting this or splitting it or anything like that. We've got all of our numbers here and everyone's very, very happy. Okay, so the goal of this was that we're trying to find the pairs within this array that, or actually, sorry, the pair. We've been told that there's only one of these. So we want to find the pair that's going to add up to 2020. Uh, so I'm going to write a function for doing that. And then we're basically just going to console log the result of that function. In fact, actually, before we go any further, let's just console log our, uh, our actual nums array just to sort of see what this is going to look like. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'll save this. And because I have the prettier extension, it's <laughs> going to give us a new line for each of the array entries. Maybe not what we're looking for, but that's okay. We can still see our code. Uh, I'm going to use the code runner extension for VS code to uh, now hit control alt N and have it run this code right within the IDE. So that's just a nice little added convenience if we're not actually going to put this into a browser. Okay. So you'll notice we've got all of our array elements. There they are. Uh, and so basically we want to find the pair that adds up to 2020. So that means we're gonna to have to go through this array probably more than once, right? If we're comparing pairs, uh, it's not just one number we need to look at individually, it, it's all of them. Um, so there, there are various ways we could do this. Uh, one way we could do it is, uh, I suppose the most naive way would be to just run through uh, a nested like double for loop. But sorry, I'm just gonna make this a function first. So I'm gonna say find, uh, find target, I'll just say is gonna be this function that's gonna have an input of target and it's going to uh, basically run through two loops. So we'll say for let i be assigned a value zero, i is less than nums.length i plus plus. And then within that, we're gonna run through another loop and I'll just use j as uh, the name of our other incrementer over here, our other index value. Okay, cool. So basically we've got these doubly nested loops. There's already kind of a bit of a problem with this, which we'll talk about in just a sec, but I'll just say compare the two numbers here. I'll just put that in the form of a comment for now. And uh, yeah, basically the idea with this is we're running through both of these loops like the full time, right? So we're starting at element zero and then element one, element two, et cetera. So I guess what I'm trying to say is if the first if the first element is element zero and we want to find like the, the other member of that pair, we probably should not com uh, compare it to itself. So we're going to move on to the next one after that. So instead of zero, maybe I'm going to use one instead. Uh, but the thing is, you know, let's say we've made it uh, up to here for I, right? Like 1072. Uh, so in that case, basically the idea is that we've already compared this number to the previous two right? Because this was J at some point when the other ones were I. So basically what I'm trying to say is we can start right after the number at I. Okay. So we can start at the next one. That way we're not making uh, comparisons based on numbers that we've already seen before, right? So I'm going to say const num1 is going to be nums at I and num2 is going to be nums at J. This isn't necessarily like a, a required step, but I just wanna make it nice and clear. So these are our actual numbers rather than the indices of these numbers. And then basically we just wanna say if num1 plus num2 is equal to our target value, which we're gonna to set to 2020, uh, then we basically wanna return num1 times num2. All right, because that's what they were asking for in the problem. They wanted the, uh, the product of these two numbers, right? So because of that, uh, we want to multiply them, but I also kind of want to keep track of them. So just before the return, I'm just going to put in a little console.log of num1 and num2 to let us know which ones they are. Okay, and then finally at the end here, I want to call our find target function and I, I want to return the result, or sorry, I want to log the result. So I'm going to do console log of find target of 2020, because that's the target we're looking for, right? Okay, so we're gonna run this code now. And if we look at the output, oh, I guess, 
Oh, whoops, I didn't save the file. <laughs> okay, so I've saved the file and now we're gonna run this again. Okay, great. So we have two numbers, we have their product. Let's think about what these uh, two lines here represent. So the first line is basically um, coming from inside the function. That's this console log on line 212 here, where I'm saying I wanna know when, what num1 and num2 are. And then we're returning from that num1 times num2, so that's gonna be the result of the find target function. So basically the thing we're console logging over here is the result of calling this function with a target of 2020, we're gonna find those two numbers, well, we've already found them, and then basically multiplying those two together, we get this result, okay? So these are two separate console logs. Okay, cool. So, hey, I think we solved the problem. We could go ahead and submit this value. Um, actually, yeah, we might as well. <laughs> Why not, right? Okay, so let's go over here and we'll go over to answer. I'm gonna paste this in. Uh, so what is that? 1,019,904, we're gonna submit that. And it turns out that's right. We got the gold star. So we're gonna continue on to part two, um, or at least, We'll continue to part two in a second. First, we wanna make this more efficient because we know now that these are the right answers. So that means we can sort of move on to part two of our strategy. We can make this more efficient. We've solved it, right? We made it work, but now we need to make it more efficient. So there are a couple of sneaky ways that we could do this. Uh, one sneaky way would be uh, to use the set data structure and then use that to just find if the, um, if the difference between the target and the number is in that set. So we'll talk about that in just a sec. Uh, the first thing I guess I just wanna say is this thing is in terms of complexity, big O of N squared, where N is the length of the nums array. Okay, so why is it N squared? Well, because we have a loop that basically goes from one to N, and then we have another loop inside of it that basically goes from one to n. I know it's i plus one, but it, I mean, it scales up the same way. This is basically an n squared uh, performance complexity, okay? Uh, which is not great, because that means like, if we were to increase the size of the input by a factor of 10, then we would actually be increasing the, the, the time of this thing, the runtime, by 100. So th that's not ideal. That's really not the greatest efficiency. We can probably make this a lot smarter. So the first strategy I'm gonna use, and this is kind of uh, just a fun aside more or less, but I'm gonna say num set is assign the value of a new set, which comes from the nums array. So if you're unfamiliar with what set means, uh, basically it's a type of data structure where we take out all repetitions. It's not indexed in the way that an array is. So there isn't like an element zero, element one, et cetera. Um, so it loses, it kind of has that drawback. We wouldn't be able to do like a loop over it. Uh, but the advantage it has is lookups, like to tell if an element is within that set, it's gonna be big O of one. So that's actually super efficient because it means basically we can just say const num is assigned the value of nums at i. And then we can basically just say if uh, num set dot has target minus num, then basically we found it, right? Let's explore what I mean by that. Uh, so actually, let's just say this, other num is gonna be target minus num. The idea here is that if these two numbers are gonna add up to whatever the target is, so in this case, 2020, right? Um, if they're gonna add up to that, then that must mean that, um, yeah, okay, hold on. We can use the power of math here to, uh, <laughs> to, to deduce this, because I'm saying num plus other num is equal to target, right? Which would mean, in other words, if we subtract num from both sides of this, other num is gonna be equal to target minus num, okay? And that's what it is equal to over here, or what it's assigned the value of. Okay, so basically we have our number, uh, and that's just going through the array, looking at every one of them, and then we're comparing that to our other number, which is the number we know it has to be. And then we're saying, does that other number actually exist within this number set? Because, you know, that. That would help, that would be good, right? So then we can say that, we can say, okay, yeah, if this exists within it, then we found it, right? Let's do our console log of num and other num, just like we had the num one and num two before, and we're just gonna return num times other num. Okay, cool. So let's save that, 
and let's run that and look at that we get the same numbers and I actually need to update this because this is no longer big O of n squared. This is big O of n. Well, that's pretty good, right? That's actually a huge, unbelievably major improvement. But there's a problem with it. The problem is this. Imagine one of the numbers we had in our nums set here, or yeah, in nums, and then that'll make it through to num set as well. Imagine one of the numbers was 1010, okay? In other words, half of the target value. If that's the case, then other num would also be half of the target value, and it would be in the num set, even though it's not supposed to be. Okay, so what I'm saying is that this would actually have um, what we'd call a false positive, right? This would say that we found the right value when we actually didn't. We could potentially, like, actually, hold on. Let me see if... Uh, let me see if this works. If I were to just, uh, yeah, I'll put it at, at the start of our nums list here. I'm gonna alter the data. I'm just gonna save this uh, 1010 and run this. And you'll notice now we get a different value. So this is kind of funny because with the test data we had before, it seemed like not only was this working beautifully, but like just unbelievably more efficiently than the other code. But that's why we have to be really, really careful about these kinds of edge cases, okay? If this was uh, something like a code signal challenge where we were given like a test suite, they would probably have this as one of the tests to make sure that we're not using uh, this kind of shortcut here with our, our num set, okay? So that's pretty sneaky. We've got to watch out for that. Uh, did I remember to delete that number from the start? No, I did not. <laughs> I'll go ahead and do that now. Okay, there we go. So we're gonna try something different altogether. Okay, so in fact, we're gonna go back to something pretty close to what we had before all this num set business was even introduced. So I'm just basically gonna do a bunch of undos uh, till we get back to that point. And there we go. Yeah, back to our big O of n squared. Okay, so now I'm gonna do something a little bit weird. Well, actually, first of all, I'm just gonna save this and then run the code again, just to make sure it's working. Yeah, great. That's the number that we remember being the correct number. Okay, great. So then um, here's what I'm gonna do. This is gonna seem maybe a bit random at first, uh, but I'm gonna sort the array. So I'm gonna say nums.sort. Now sort is a mutating method, which means it's actually going to change the values in nums, or I shouldn't say change the values. It's gonna change the order of the values in nums. Uh, if we were to try to do it just like this, it actually would not produce the results we're looking for because it would default to a lexicographic sort. So we need to provide a callback function here, which is gonna instruct the sort function on how to actually sort these numbers. In other words, we want to sort them as numbers, right? We want them like um, in numerical order rather than like alphabetical order, basically. Uh, you may have seen this before in terms of like um, file managers where you'll have like, oh, file one, file 10, file two. Uh, that's basically what this would have done if we hadn't included this uh, callback function here. Okay, so I'm gonna save this and you might think like, what was the point of this? And to answer your question, the point was actually just to see if it still works. So I want to know, well, hey, you know, throwing in that like 1010 had a, a really strange effect on that other um, version of the code. Is this going to have a strange effect on this version of the code? And the answer is uh, no, it doesn't look like it. I mean, the only difference is that we end up encountering the 996 before the 1024, but it doesn't affect the final result. And I have to imagine that's actually probably why on Advent of Code they, they asked for the product of these two numbers because that way the order doesn't matter, right? So we're still getting the same product. I think we're good here. It's still working even though it's a sorted array. Okay. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is basically this over here, the fact that we started at i plus 1. Because um, we did that because we didn't want to repeat calculations that we had already done, right? Uh, the idea being that, number one, we don't want to compare the number to itself, right? Because then we would have that false positive with 1010. Uh, but number two, that we also want to make sure we're not repeating calculations that we don't have to. And so sorting this array is actually going to unlock some additional possibilities in terms of stuff that we can uh, ignore, basically pairs that we won't have to consider by virtue of the fact that we now know that these numbers are sorted. Okay, so 
Before I actually illustrate what I mean by that, I'm gonna do one more weird thing. So basically, right now, we've got our nested for loops, right? We're going through the array um, as many times as there are elements in the array, right? Um, and basically, I, I sorted these elements, it didn't make a difference, it still works, right? Now I'm gonna flip one of, the, uh, one of the loops, I'm gonna flip the order of it. So I'll go right to left, just for fun. I'm gonna make it J minus minus, so that's counting down instead of up. I'm gonna say that J has to be greater than I, otherwise we won't enter the loop again. And we're gonna start at nums.length minus one. By the way, you might be noticing here, nums.length, nums.length, maybe we want to assign a variable to that so we don't have to keep writing this out every time. Uh, that's something we might want to consider, but for now we'll just keep it like this. Now the reason I wanted to do this was, again, just to make sure that it's still working, and it looks like it is. Okay, so that's great. So basically, uh, we know it's working like this, at this point, you're probably thinking, okay, what, what is the point of all this? Why did we bother sorting this and flipping around this second loop, uh, aside from just uh, being able to tell that it's still gonna work? Well, here's what I wanna do. I wanna go over to the whiteboard now, and I wanna consider the cases that we're actually gonna be allowed to ignore, okay? So notice we have our two indices, uh, or we could call these our two pointers, right, that are pointing to different sides of the array. And I just sort of filled in dummy data for these numbers. These aren't the actual values that, uh, that we have in the problem, but, uh, they'll illustrate the point of what we're trying to do here. Okay, so basically we'll look at our first numbers. We have two and then 2019. We add those together and we get 2021. That's actually too big. That's greater than, than 2020. So then we can say, all right, well, we'll move on with, uh, with one of our pointers. But then we realize, well, hold on a sec. We know that 2019, when we added two to it, it was already too big. And we know that because this is sorted, all of the other elements are also going to be too big. In fact, even more too big. I don't know if that was grammatically correct. But anyway, we can avoid having to check all of these other elements because we know they wouldn't produce a, a, a small enough value, right? They would be way too big. Okay, so instead we just say, oh, well, it was too big. So we, we're actually just going to move on to the next... Um, we're going to move the other pointer, right? We're going to move on to the next number on the right because we know that this number is actually gonna be smaller. So we say, okay, two plus 2015, that's 2017, that's too small. So that means it actually does make sense to check the next one. So now we add three in 2015, we get 2018, still too small, so we're gonna move on to the next one. And we say seven plus 2015, ooh, now that's too big, isn't it? That's 2022. Okay, well, guess what? That means we don't need to bother checking all the rest of these. We can just stop here at the seven and we can say, okay, now let's move on to 2012 and we can reset the other pointer, right? But wait a minute, hold on a sec. Do we really need to reset the other pointer? That's the question, okay? So in the same way that we knew that we could stop this one, like we don't need to go all the way uh, because we already know no more of the values are gonna be uh, small enough. All of the other values are gonna be too big. Well, similarly, we know that like the two and the three over here, we've tested those with larger numbers and they didn't produce the results we were looking for, right? Um, so when we're checking 2012, uh, we don't need to compare it against these other ones because those were too small. Right? And we know that this one, well, actually we can make that comparison now. Uh, so we can, we can say seven plus 2012, and that's gonna give us 2019. So that's too small. We'll move on to this one over here. And now 10 plus 2012, that's 2022, too big, right? So now we can move this one in. And now at this point, uh, again, just like before, we don't need to bother starting over here. We don't need to check all of these values because we knew that these three values were too small when compared with 2012. So they're definitely gonna be too small when compared with 2010. Okay, so that now in this case, when we add these two numbers together, they're the actual solution. So that's great. We found the two numbers and then we'd multiply them together, et cetera, et cetera. But what I'm trying to illustrate here is this basic idea that if you look at how this worked, um, take a look at, at when we move these pointers inwards and when we move them outwards, okay? So basically, to begin with, we can tell the sum is too large, so we moved this pointer inwards. Then, 
we said, okay, this sum is too small. So we moved this pointer inwards. And then we compared these two and we said, ah, still too small. So we moved this pointer inwards. And then we said, oh, well now it's too big. So we moved this pointer inwards. You're maybe noticing a pattern here. We always move inwards. These pointers never have to reset. So because of that, we can actually just remember the values. And if you think about it, we're actually only going through the array once now because these pointers are going to meet somewhere in the middle. Assuming they don't find their target, they're going to meet somewhere in the middle and say, oh, I guess we didn't find it. Too bad. Uh, and they're going to stop there, right? Uh, so like basically we, we cover the left part of the array with this pointer and then we cover the right part of the array with this pointer, okay? So basically the idea is that we're gonna find our solution and we're only gonna go through the array once. So it's actually gonna be big O of N instead of big O of N squared, at least for that part. Now, let's not get too excited. But anyway, uh, this does seem very exciting to me. I'm gonna switch back to the full mode over here and uh, or the full view, I should say. And I'm basically just gonna scrap all this. I'm gonna start over. I'm gonna say, okay, you know what? We're gonna let L be assigned the value of zero. That's our left pointer. And then I'm gonna say, let R be assigned the value of nums minus, uh, nums dot length minus one. Okay, cool. And now I'm gonna say, while L is less than R. We're using a while loop. So a while loop is like a for loop, except it's just the condition part of it. So it's gonna be up to us how we wanna increment or decrement these variables, these pointers. And keep in mind, like we saw in the illustration just a sec ago, uh, the left pointer will only ever get incremented. It'll only ever get plus plus, whereas the right pointer will only ever get minus minus. Okay, so let's try this out. What do we wanna do here? Well, we'll say const num1 is nums at uh, whoops, it's not I anymore, it's L, okay. And I could even call this like, uh, you know, left num, right num. It's really up to you. Uh, variable naming is, is more of an art than a science, but it's an important one. Okay, so we've got our two numbers and we basically just wanna say if the sum is equal to the target. So first of all, if, yeah, if the sum of these two numbers, oh wait, I should calculate the sum, shouldn't I? <laughs> okay, so const sum is assigned the value of num1 plus num2. Okay, cool, I'll just save that so it lines them up. Yeah, there we go. Uh, okay, cool, so we got our sum, and we just say if sum is equal to target, then, you know, we found it. We'll do the same thing as we did before. Console log num1, num2, and then we're going to return num1 times num2. Okay, cool. Uh, otherwise, you know, if, if it's not equal to the target, uh, then we're gonna say, well, what happened? Was it too big or too small? If the sum was too small, the sum was strictly less than target, then we're basically gonna say uh, it wasn't big enough. We need to make these numbers bigger, right? So thinking back to this example over here, when the numbers weren't big enough, we need to move one of these to the right. We need to increment one of these, right? So we need to move this up, move the left pointer up, if the sum is too small. So we'll say L plus plus, and then we'll just repeat the loop, okay? And actually, I'm realizing I could just make this an else if. That, that would be nicer, right? I think? Yeah, else if. And I'll just save that to line it up. Yeah, great. Uh, and then we'll say else, and I think at this point I could probably just say elf, uh, sorry, else. <laughs> Uh, but instead, I'm, I'm going to be explicit about it and say, if the sum is strictly greater than the target, then we're going to say R minus minus. Now, keep in mind, this loop is going to keep going as long as L is less than R. And R, R is either going to decrease or L is going to increase or we're just going to return and break out of the loop. So basically, if this loop completes and nothing happens, then we're going to return... Uh, let's say negative uh, one. Yeah, let's return negative one. Uh, this is maybe not the best way of doing it, but uh, you know, it, it'll get the job done, I think. Okay, so we're going to save that. Okay, so this is now our find target button. I'm gonna delete this part because we don't know if it actually is big O of N squared. If what I promised you before is true, then actually it should turn out to be more like big O of N. 
But the main thing is we need to make sure before anything else that it actually works. <laughs> so let's try it. And hey, there we go. So we've got our numbers here. And this is much more efficient because if you think about it, we don't have nested loops anymore. All we have is this, this single while loop. And that's much nicer. Okay, cool. So a few things to say about this. So yes, we are now only going through the array once. So this is linear time complexity. This is big O of N now. However, because we spent the time sorting the array first, that's actually gonna cost us more uh, than the actual find target function. So for sorting, if you wanna sort an array, there are various ways to do it. Um, technically, I think there are some algorithms that'll run in greater, like better time complexity than this. Uh, but those are kind of niche and, and I think they may be sort of specialized cases. So let's just assume, you know, a traditional merge sort or quick sort or something like that. Basically the built-in sort function, we can safely assume it's gonna be n log n. We can get into the reason for that at another point, but uh, for now I just wanna say, because this is big O of n log n and this part is big O of n, that means this whole thing would basically be big O of n log n, because this is the greater complexity. We could say it's n log n plus n, but n log n is, I think, enough here. Okay, so at this point, we've done our first two steps. So we've made the code work, and now we've actually made it efficient. Cool. So there's only one thing left. We've got to make it beautiful. Okay, cool. So let's make it beautiful. The first thing I'm noticing about this is... I'm seeing while loops, I'm seeing ifs. I don't wanna be seeing those things. I want, I want this to be completely functional. So how can we replace a loop? How could we replace something like this uh, in a way that's gonna be completely functional and, and not using any of the, uh, not having any side effects or anything like that? And basically the answer is recursion, okay? So, Recursion is a strategy that's uh, fairly common within functional programming. It's fairly common within programming, I guess I could say, uh, more broadly speaking. But basically the idea is we're gonna make this into a recursive function. Now, if you're unfamiliar, a recursive function is a function that calls itself. And so it's a lot like a loop. Uh, the idea is that instead of just saying like plus plus and then move on to the next iteration, we're actually gonna call the function again, but with different values, different starting values. Um, so hopefully this is all making sense and all good and nice, because uh, I'm about to delete it. <laughs> I don't wanna see this anymore. Uh, so basically we wanna make this a recursive function. Uh, and we'll, we'll sort of, maybe I should keep this here just so we can sort of uh, compare it. Oh, you know what would be kind of cool? We could do like a split screen kind of thing. No, 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 we'd need a new file to do that. Anyway, okay, let's just do this one step at a time. So we know that our sort of like starting conditions are, are like base cases are uh, that L is zero and R is nums.length minus one. Okay, uh, and then the other thing to, to note here is like, we've got let, you know, we're, we're changing these values. That's no good. That's not something we would wanna see in a functional programming scenario. Okay, so basically what I'm gonna do with this is I'm gonna add these variables as inputs to the code here. Uh, so they're like arguments, right? L is gonna have a default value of zero. R is gonna have a default value of nums.length minus one. If you're unfamiliar with these default values, by the way, uh, the way a default value works is basically like if you give it this and then you don't actually give it the argument, uh, it'll just assume this is the value you wanted. Uh, so, you know, maybe not a bad idea to have that in there, but I wanna make sure this code is nice and modular, that it's gonna work for other targets other than 2020, because, you know, eventually it's gonna be a new year. Okay, so we've got L and we've got R. Well, actually we have them right here, so we don't need to be defining these. And now we wanna say while, well, the while is gonna be kind of implicit to the recursion. Uh, the, you'll see what I mean. Uh, but basically the idea is I'm just gonna say, uh, let's say num1 and num2, let's assign those to begin with. So we'll say nums at L and nums at R. Okay, so we've got our two numbers and let's assign the sum as well. So sum is gonna be num1 plus num2. Okay, cool. So now we basically wanna make the same comparisons. We wanna say, well, okay, if the sum is equal to the target, 
then we want to return it, right? So I'll do the same console log. Oh, and hey, um, this is a question I have for you, dear viewer. If I do a console log inside of a function, is that considered a side effect? I'm really not sure. I can't wait to hear from you on that one. Uh, okay, cool. So basically we have this, sum is equal to target. Okay, uh, we also want to consider uh, well, basically, I'll just put our else ifs in here. So else if sum is less than target, then, okay, notice before we said L++. So now what we're going to do is we'll say find target. We're going to call this function again. Is the target the same? You know it is. Okay, so target's the same. Is L the same? Well, no, it's actually one greater. Is R the same? Yeah, R is the same. Okay, great. So there we go. Find target. Okay, and then else if sum is greater than target, then in that case, we'll say, okay, well, in that case, find target. Target's the same. L's the same. R is not the same. R is less than what it was before. Okay, so are we all good? Well, not quite, because we're actually not considering this condition right here. And that's kind of an important one. We don't want this to keep running if we get to the point where L and R pass each other. Okay. So, and I'm also not including this return negative one. So let's actually start with that. We're going to say if L is greater than or equal to R. So if we have the opposite of L is less than R, then we could just say like, you know, return or something. Like that. In fact, I'll put it in here. So return, uh, and we'll just say negative one. Okay, and then we'll make this an else if instead of just the original if. And you know, I'm realizing these two are not returning anything. They should actually be returning the result of find target with those other values. Okay, cool. So that is looking very interesting. Hopefully it's still big O of N. Hopefully it still runs. Uh, I'm gonna save that. So yeah, nice. Looking, looking more functional. We're, we're, we've got a lot of constants here. We're not using those lets anymore. Let's run the code. Let's see what happens. Nice, okay. So in case it's unclear why I thought that was good, these numbers are matching the numbers we had before. So that means our code is still working, uh, but it's working in a functional way. So that's cool. Now, I wanna make this a little more in line with the functional paradigm, which means I don't wanna actually be messing around with these if statements. Instead, I wanna use ternaries. Okay, so something to note that's kind of interesting here, every one of these ifs ends with a return. Okay, so I could actually say return, because that's what we're gonna start with. What are we returning? Well, let's see, is L greater than or equal to R? Because if so, return negative one. Otherwise, return something else. What's the something, you know, you may have seen a ternary before, basically it's like this. If this condition is true, it's gonna be the first one. If this condition is false, it's gonna be the second one. And there are only two of them here. Uh, we can't have like additional cases after that and stuff. Uh, but what we can do is nest these ternaries. So we could say is sum equal to target? And if sum is equal to target, then we're gonna return num one times num two. Uh, otherwise, if it's not equal, then we ask ourselves, well, is it less than target? And if it is, we're gonna return find target of all that nice stuff down there. So same target, L plus one, and then same R as before. And if that's not the case, that sum is less than target, and I apologize, I realize this is getting pretty gross. Uh, I, I seem to recall saying that this was the step where we're gonna make the code beautiful. So I'm sorry we haven't reached <laughs> that result yet, but uh, here, hopefully this actually still works. We'll save it and, oh, there we go. That beautified it for us. Oh, that looks kind of weird, but <laughs> anyway, let's try it. Okay, cool. So notice there's something a little bit different about this and it's the fact that we're not getting that console log of what the two numbers actually are here. So uh, there, there are ways around that, you know, like uh, for example, we could say instead of just returning, um, like if sum is equal to target, instead of just returning num1 plus num, or times num2, uh, we could handle that like a little bit differently. Maybe we could say like return, um, or, or yeah, basically call the function again and then have some sort of conditional checking for that doing a console log, but anyway. 
I think this is fine for now. After all, what we really need in the end is this, the product uh, of, of these two numbers, right? So now, I mean, we kind of, we know that 2020 is a possible value that these numbers add up to. Uh, we didn't really test before if there are other numbers uh, that could work here. So we could we could check this. We could just take like, for example, these, these two numbers right here. Uh, so 1384 plus 1396, and we could just sort of add those together. Uh, let me just do that quickly in my head. And of course I don't have a calculator open to the side here, just out of view, that would be cheating. Um, yeah, doing that in my head, I got the number 2,780. So 2780, we're gonna do that. And now we should expect that this is gonna give us some result. In fact, we should expect it's gonna give us these two numbers multiplied together. And, um, I might as well go ahead and do the mental math for that one. And uh, now that I'm done stalling for time, it should give us 1,932,064. So let's try saving this and running this. And well, that's not the value that we got. So why is that not the value that we got? I'm assuming it's because there are other numbers in here that actually sum to this amount, 2,780. And so basically it found those. Now keep in mind, like the, the data we were given has ensured that there's only one pair that's gonna add up to 2020, uh, but they make no such assurances for any other numbers. So there could be other pairs that add up to this. Uh, I'm gonna make it a remarkably small number now so that it you know would be pretty much impossible for there to be uh, a result for this one. So I'm expecting that this is gonna go through the entire array and never find a matching pair. And so it's gonna return negative one. Let's see if that ends up being true. Yeah, it returned negative one. Okay, so this is nice. I'm enjoying this. I think uh, we've got a pretty, pretty good looking solution over here. So we've got this part that's big O of N log N. We've got this part that's big O of N. It's totally functional, I believe. I don't think we have any side effects or anything like that in here. And then basically when we call that with the 2020 number that we were originally supplied with, we get the same result as we did with our previous versions of the code. Uh, whereas when we try it out with one that shouldn't work, we get a negative one result. Okay, congrats. We've completed the three steps of our strategy here. So I think we're, we're pretty much done for our day one challenge. Oh, but wait. It told us that that was the right answer before and that we got one gold star, but we haven't looked at part two yet. Let's take a look at part two. Okay, so basically this is where the first half is done and then part two is down here. So part two is basically saying now using the same data, we actually wanna find the three numbers that add to 2020. So nice that the data is the same, right? So it specifically tells us, although it hasn't changed, you can still get your puzzle input, it's still the same, okay? So that means it's still the same nums that we have over here, uh, which is convenient. Okay, cool. So basically at this point, we need to find three entries that sum to this. Okay, so do we wanna do like a, a triple nested loop now? Does that, does that sound like fun? Uh, probably not, but we'll, we'll see. So, hmm, we could do that. D does anyone wanna see that? It would be like a big O of N cubed. I don't know if it's worth doing it that way or not. It would be very brute force. We kinda saw how that would look with our original formulation of the problem. The only difference is that instead of just having like a loop that starts with I assigned the value of zero and then a loop that starts with J assigned the value of I plus one, we would also have the one that starts with an index of like K that's J plus one. Uh, okay, so I'm not gonna go through that but what I will do is basically go through the more efficient solution of this one. Cause I'm thinking now that we've done all this nice, functional, efficient code, it would kind of be a shame to go back to the brute force way that we did it before. So 
Now that we have the problem in mind here, uh, I'm gonna switch back to the full view and we'll talk about how we could actually approach this in a way that uses the code that we've already written. And I have to say, I mean, this, this is really a, a testament to, to how beautifully constructed this challenge is. The fact that we're able to actually use this code uh, in order to implement a very efficient solution to this next part, I, I think it goes to the elegance of this puzzle design. Okay, so, Basically, here's what we want to do. We have find target, right? We already know that one. Uh, and we're going to use it. But this time, the target is going to be different. And you might, you might be thinking, well, hold on a sec. You might have misread. The target still says 2020 over here. And yeah, that's a good point. So basically, here's what we're going to do, okay? We're going to build off of what we already have. And here's our strategy. So instead of just this, here's what I'm going to say. So we're gonna go through each num in the array. And for each one of these nums, like, uh, you know, let, here, I'll, I'll, I'll do it more visually. I'll say, okay, well, we need to find a, a trio of numbers here, right? Maybe this is one of them, right? Maybe it's one of them. It might not be, but maybe it's one of them. Uh, now, if this is one of the numbers, then we would know that the other two numbers would have to add up to 636. Why 636? Well, again, I just did a little more mental math and I did 2020 minus 1384 and it's 636. I mean, yeah, if this is gonna be one of our other numbers, then the other two need to add up to the amount that's gonna make it 2020, right? So basically, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go through each num in the array and then I'm gonna do find target for 2020 minus num, okay? The missing part of it, basically. And then we'll see what happens with that. I mean, it should be the case that only three of these end up giving us a result, but eh, who knows? We'll see what happens. Okay, so go through each num in the array. Well, we'll use a loop for now. So we'll say for let i be assigned the value of zero, i is less than nums dot length, i plus plus. Even if we wanted to use a loop, there are probably nicer ways that we could have done it than this. But we'll talk about that in just a sec. Uh, but basically, yeah, we want to, uh, we want to do this. <laughs> so uh, yeah, find target for 2020 minus num. So we'll say const, um, uh, I guess, product, right? Because we are getting a product from our find target function. So product is gonna be assigned the value of find target with our 2020 minus num, okay? So that's that's like the, the remainder or, you know, the difference between 2020 and the number that we've already selected. Okay, so that's our product. And then I just wanna say if product is not negative one, then let's actually console log what the num was, okay? So that's kind of interesting. Uh, this might seem like it's going to console log a lot of stuff, but it should turn out that actually only three numbers should result in a console log um, because there should only be three that work. So let's see. We're going to save that and then we're going to try it out. And hey, lo and behold, we get three numbers. That's not bad. Okay, so I guess we could verify that these actually add up to the the right number, so 220 plus 816 plus 984. You might hear me tapping the buttons of my mental calculator. Uh, 2020, yeah, looks like that's correct. So good stuff. All right, so those are three numbers that add to 2020, so that part is good. And I, I mean, they must all be three numbers from the array, because that's that's where these are coming from, right? In fact, um, just real quick, I, I do want to talk about this. Since we're not using i here, like we don't need to know the index, there's actually a much more efficient way we could do this. So we could say for const num of nums. So this is a for of loop. It's a really nice thing to use if you're not concerned with functional programming, but of course we are. So we're gonna do this in a different way. So I think in terms of our strategy, we've made it work, congratulations. Now we wanna make it efficient. Actually, it is efficient, <laughs> sorry. Now we wanna make it beautiful and functional. Uh, we know it's efficient because we built upon this efficient function that we used originally. So if you think about it, like this is going through the array, each number in the array, so this part is gonna be big O of N, but then within this, we're doing a fine target, like this line on its own is a big O of N, 
and we're doing that n many times. So this actually would be big O of n squared, okay? Uh, and then if we wanted to like add up the whole thing, basically n log n is not gonna be as much as n squared. So n squared is basically what the complexity will come down to in the end. But anyway, uh, let's make this functional and then uh, we can probably call it a day from there. So basically, big O of n squared, that's good. I just don't like the for loop. So instead of a for loop, we're gonna use some higher order array function. Uh, so we could say something like nums dot for each. Okay, and then we'll give this a callback, which will take a num and then do this stuff uh, inside of it. I'll just hold alt and move that up, which is a nice VS code shortcut. And now we don't have the for loop. So is this good? Well, let's see, does it work? <laughs> yeah, it works, okay, great. So, uh, all right. I think this this could be nicer though. Um, this, what I'm about to do is a bit hacky. Oh, oh, by the way, sorry, just in case anyone's wondering about this, nums dot for each, like that's an array built in. So any array, you can do a for each function and then basically the input of this callback inside is gonna be the number. So this is just like for const num of nums that we had before, okay? Same sort of thing. It's just more functional this way. Okay, so for each is a way to do this. It's sort of the intended way to do this. I've been told, and I find this very hacky, but I've been told by some people that if we just make it a map, it actually ends up being more efficient, which is kind of surprising to me. I'm not sure why. It's also good for code golfing, but eh, I don't feel super good about that. Instead, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna use filter, okay? So the way filter works is you give it a conditional uh, at the end. So we're gonna return some kind of Boolean, right? Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I, not a conditional, a Boolean, something that's true or false. So I'm gonna say return product is greater than negative one. This might look like a weird thing to be returning because it seems like we're sort of comparing these two numbers. But keep in mind, product is greater than negative one is just something that boils down to a Boolean. It's gonna be true or it's gonna be false. So the thing we're returning here is either true or it's false, okay? If it's true, the way filter works is it'll say, okay, I'll save that number. I'll keep that inside the array. Oh, look at that. Yeah, it returns the elements of an array that meet the condition specified in a callback function. Perfect, so that's, that's what I said. Um, so basically, yeah, the idea here is that if this thing is true, it's gonna keep num in the array. If this thing is false, it's gonna remove num from the array. So how many elements should we expect to see in this array? Well, we're not actually returning anything or console logging anything. So maybe we should do that. Uh, I'll just say const good nums is assigned the value of nums.filter. And then we'll just do a console log of good nums. Okay, save that, run that. And there we go. So it looks a little bit different because we're doing the filter, uh, but I actually kind of prefer that because you know, it's, it's neat. We've got these, uh, these three numbers here uh, nicely packed into an array. And basically all we need to do from here is multiply those three numbers together. Now we could just say, well actually, yeah, check it out. There are a couple of ways we could do that. We could do this and use a destructuring assignment here and say const A, B, and C are these three numbers and we want a console, I'll just put them individually, A, B, and C, and then actually A times B times C, okay? Let's try that. Uh, I'll save, I'll do this to run the code, and there we go. So now we have the three numbers being console logged and the product, the result. So that's pretty cool. In fact, you know, that, that might be my favorite way to do it. Um, but just in case it's not your favorite way to do it, let's try it a different way. So imagine we didn't know that there were exactly three numbers inside of our good nums array. You know, imagine there were maybe four or five or something like that, right? So how could we multiply them all together, not knowing how many there are? Well, we have another array built in for that. It's called reduce. And basically the way this one works is we're gonna give it a callback function that's gonna have two elements. So it's gonna have the accumulator. In other words, in this case, the sum, or no, sorry, the product, the thing that we're like uh, rolling up here, the big snowball that's rolling up as we go through these elements. And then this one is just gonna be the current number, okay? Now, what is product? What is it, what value does it start at? And the answer is whatever value we give it as a second argument, okay? So it might seem weird seeing a comma here before I finish this actual function. Here, I'll finish the function. It's just product times num. And that actually should not be a zero, it should be a one. Um, 
Basically, the idea is it's going to take a look at this array and it's going to say, OK, so let's start out with product. Well, actually, sorry, there are two ways you can do this. If you give it this number, it'll say, I'll start out with this as the value of product and then num will be the first element of the array. And I'm going to multiply those. And now the result of that is product for the next num. OK, uh, so it basically just rolls these up like a snowball. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to say is if we don't provide this, then it just takes the first two and says, OK, so this is product and this is num. So we could have actually done it that way and not included the uh, the one, but eh, who cares? Uh, OK, so we're going to save this. We're going to run this. We're going to look at the result. It's the same result we were looking at before. I feel pretty good about that. And I feel especially good that we were able to actually look at all of these nice, beautiful array built-ins. We've got map, we've got for each, we've got reduce, we've got filter. Uh, we looked at a little bit of destructuring. Hey, this was a pretty rich assignment. We, we learned a lot of stuff here. So I'm gonna copy this number. I'm gonna bring this back over to our split screen and I'm gonna paste this in. I hope we get it right. Here we go. There it is, okay, nice job. Now, like I was saying before, uh, the inputs are gonna be different for everyone here, right? So you might not get the same input data. In fact, it would be like exorbitantly uh, improbable that you would, <laughs> but anyway, you're probably gonna have different numbers, so like your answer will be different from mine. Uh, but in terms of the code, that can all be the same. You can use this. You're, you're welcome to follow along with this. Anyway, um, yeah, I guess that's about it for this one. Let me know if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. Uh, you can leave a comment below. Uh, this was a lot of fun. I enjoyed this, and uh, I look forward to continuing these. So hope to see you again in the next video, and uh, remember to believe in yourself. Anything's possible. Bye.